sorry. Emmanuel Kant part two. I was muted. <laughs> so, all right. So let's review what we did last time because um, it's been a week. <laughs> so last time, what did we do? We figured out there were two parts in us in conflict, right? Instinct, reason. We figured out that we were made for more than happiness, right? We talked about that. And then we talked about a different case scenarios, right? Where we were trying to figure out which voice is speaking. Is it instinct or reason? And some scenarios were okay, except one. Remember the one where your best friend's father died? She is, this is terrible. This actually happens to some of you. So it was like, we're turning it into a joke, but this is not unrealistic here at Queens College. Anyways, she has to cheat off of you. There's no way she can make it. There's no way she's going to even survive her four years at Queens College. And half of you, now we're becoming more split. There was some confusion about what is the right thing to do. Half of you said, yes, she can cheat off of me. Half of you said, no. And we still do not know which one is the Kantian approach, right? So today, finally, we're going to look at the voice of reason, what it sounds like, right? Last time we talked about what the voice of instinct sounds like. Now we're finally going to go into what the voice of reason sounds like. For now, we just know it's, it's the voice of reason is thinking not of the good for me, but of the good. Okay, so that's all we knew from last time. So make sure you write this down, right? Instinct is thinking about what is good for me. Happiness, what is good for me. But reason is thinking about a higher type of good, which we don't know yet what it looks like, but uh, Kant calls it, right, the good. Okay, so let's go into the text, page 34. Today we will be able to resolve the cheating issue, the cheating problem. Okay, <clears throat> so first we begin on 34. Um, He's going to reiterate a, a few points that we did last time. Are you there on the top here, philosophy? Everybody with me? Raise, put your hand up if you're with me. Wave at me. Okay. Page 34, the top. Okay. So he says this. Here, philosophy is, so as when it comes to making a moral judgment, deciding what is the right thing to do, this is all of us with the cheating problem, right? Here, he says, philosophy is seen, in fact, to be put in a precarious position. We don't know what to do which should be firm even though there is neither in heaven nor on earth anything upon which it depends or is based. So let's stop a little bit to review what does Kant here mean by heaven. So he says our decision cannot be based on heaven. It cannot be based on earth. What does he mean? So he's trying to be poetic, right? What does he mean by heaven here? And then what does he mean by earth? What is he alluding to when he says heaven cannot help us? Yes. Okay, very good, right? He, we are, remember, we're in modern, modern times, right? I think I said this in the introductory video. Kant is in the time where religion is being set aside as an authority, right? We're not relying anymore on outside authority. We're not relying on the priest. We're not relying on scripture. So heaven cannot help us. And what does he mean by earth? This is a trickier. You have to know more, a little bit more about uh, modern philosophy to figure out what is earth. But what do you think it means? Um, almost, <laughs> uh, almost, very close. What is another place where we base our moral path? Yes, uh, yes, th there's two ways to see this. One could be, yes, absolutely, society dictates what we should do. And he's saying, again, society is not going to help you, right? This is, or a lot of philosophers would base their morality on nature, right? They would say, what is natural is right and what is unnatural is wrong. By the way, this is still an argument used in the LGBT question, right? Oh, it's not natural to be gay. Nature doesn't do it, so it's wrong, right? This is an argument from nature. And by the way, nature does it. Right? So, bad news. Right? So anyways, I'm setting that aside, right? So a lot of people base their moral arguments on nature. It's not natural, and therefore it's wrong. But if we follow nature, it's not the greatest example. I'll give you an, a terrible example that happened to me in a moment of innocence. So I was coming home from school. I was like in eighth grade, and I had a bad day. And I was like, oh, I just need to purify myself. I'm going to sit in front of the, it used to be called the Discovery Channel. Does it still exist? It's like the Nature okay. Channel. Okay, it was the Discovery. I was like, I'm, just, I'm not going to watch MTV. I'm not going to watch, watch Discovery Channel, right? Do we still have MTV? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, I'm not going to pervert myself. I'm just going to watch animals, right? You know, frolic. So I'm sitting here watching this documentary on, on seals. You know, seals, these kind of 
-hmm. shiny animals from the sea. Okay. <laughs> So I'm looking, there's a little baby seal, and I'm like, oh, this is so nice, so cute, jumping in the water. Oh, you know this documentary? <laughs> and then I see a father seal, you know, and then I see father seal and baby seal doing something. And I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> and then the narrator, right, explaining that when there's not enough women, the, the males go to their children. The babies. No, it's worse. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, I am completely, like all my purity was like, I wanted to detox and now I was super toxic, right? So nature, not an example, clearly on how to behave, right? This is the, I was like, so like, I think I just lost all my innocence from childhood. Everything was gone. Like, I didn't even know that was even possible. So. Anyway, so that's the nature for you. So clearly nature is not a good guide when it comes to morality, right? That's the bottom line. And don't watch the Discovery Channel when you want to relax. Uh, it's full of murders and bloodshed and incest and it's so bad, right? Okay, anyways, I, I hope I made my... So Kant is aware, right? Nature cannot help us. Heaven cannot help us. What, what is left? What does Kant believe? Where is the moral voice to be found, if you remember? within us, right? It's here, right? The, 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 the law is written on our hearts. We all know deep down the moral law, right? Not the law out there. The moral law is already inscribed on the tablets of our hearts, right? According to Kant. So all of us really deep down we know. We don't need someone to tell us what is right and wrong. We know. The problem is instinct overrides systematically our moral uh, voices, right? So remember, that's the reason he wrote this book is to make sure that we become more attuned to that voice which is, has become very soft-spoken over the years because instinct has taken over, right? The, the will to be happy is so powerful in most of us that we don't even hear another voice at times, right? Okay, so he goes back to this, right? And now we're going to go back again, but much more details on this distinction between instinct and reason, but now we're going to go much deeper into what reason really means. So let's go to 35. <coughs> Uh, you see the second paragraph, and then in the middle, to the left, you have a capital H, hence, can you find that? Mm -hmm. Okay, second paragraph, middle, hence there arises. Okay, so he is now again distinguishing instinct, reason, but in different words. Hence there arises the distinction between subjective ends, which rest on incentives, and objective ends, which depend on motives valid for every rational being. Okay, translation. Subjective ends, write this down, objective ends. In other words, two possible directions, two possible uh, orientations, subjective or objective, right? So we don't know which one yet is instinct and reason. We have to go a little deeper. He describes subjective ends resting on incentives. Incentive is what? What's good for me? What's in it for me? That's an incentive, right? So subjective ends have to do with what's in it for me, what's good for me. Which one is that, instinct or reason? Instinct, happiness, what's in it for me? The question of what's in it for me is the question of instinct, right? So the other one now goes deeper. Objective ends, now we know, is reason. And now we get a little deeper, which depends on motives valid for every rational being. In other words, it's not just what's in it for me, it's what's in it for a rational being. Okay, this is shifting, which includes me, by the way. We're going to talk about that. So now we have to understand. So when you're thinking on the line of reason, you're thinking not of me, I'm thinking of, the rational being, and I'm trying to honor this rational being in my action, right? So we don't know yet how. So before we can go any further, we have to understand what does he mean by rational being, right? What is that? How do we, in order to act towards a rational being in the right way, I have to know what it is, right? So he describes this, skipping down, third paragraph, definition of rational being. Now I say that man, and in general, every rational being, now is the definition, exists as an end in himself and not merely as a means to be arbitrarily used by this or that will. Okay, can anyone translate? How does one treat a rational being in a way that honors their rationality based on this text? Anybody caught the meaning? In other words, let me rephrase the question. What is the difference between a rational being and this bottle? This will help you immediately. What's the difference between a rational being 
and the bottle that I'm holding. How are we different? <laughs> no, that's not this based on this definition. <laughs> yes? I, I heard a voice. No, I said it was no, no, no. <laughs> Based on what he's saying, watch what he says again, right? In, a rational being exists as an end in himself, meaning I exist as an end in myself, whereas the bottle is a means to be arbitrarily used by this or that will. So what's the difference between me and the bottle? Yes. You use the bottle. Yes. Excellent. Okay. There, the difference between a rational being and all the other objects in the world is that a rational being if you want to treat them as a rational being, you have to abstain from using them. Because as, as soon as you start to use them, they're not a rational being anymore, they are a bottle. Okay? So this is basically what Kant is saying, is that there's a difference in the world between people and objects, right? And that to treat people as people, the way that you treat people as people is to refrain from using them when you are tempted to do so. Whereas objects, they are there to be used. And in fact, most of our dealings, most of our uh, urge in the world is to use whatever is there. We want to take, we want to use, we want to throw away when we're done. This is the natural response to our environment as instinctual beings, right? Our natural response is, I want to take, I want to use, I want to have. Kant says, yes, you can do that with everything except the rational being. Rational being, you stop. This is one being in the world which you, if you want to respect that, their personhood, you have to step back and not use. And reason is the part in you that is identifying in the world, ah, rational being, ah, object. Here's a rational being, pull back, okay? Let me say all of that again in different words so you can really follow, <laughs> okay? So, basically what Kant is saying, right? Let me start from the very beginning. As instinctual beings, we tend to just want to have whatever exists. This is the baby, right? Baby just grabs whatever is there. He, he grabs his mother's face, he grabs the toy, he grabs you, right? Always taking, taking. This is normal instinctual behavior, right? But Kant is saying there is part of us which is not like that, and which is aware that there are entities in the world which are sacred, which are holy ground, and which we cannot just take and discard like any old object. And we sense it when we're about to do it. This, so for example, suppose you, yeah, here's a good one. Um, so you're in a party and you know, you've been kind of single for a while and you're sick and tired of it. And you know, you kind of like, you need a break from the singleness. You go to the party, you meet this amazing hot person, right? Like, you talk a little bit, you're like, nah, I'm never going to be in a relationship with that person for sure. And you're kind of stupid, you know, but they look really hot. And, you know, I could use, you know, a little bit of, you know, nice, easy relaxation time tonight, right? So now you're tempted, right? Like, let, maybe we can just go home, you know, and have fun. And, of course, hopefully, <laughs> part of you will be like, what? What's going on? <laughs> right? What, is, what are the two voices going to pop up in your head? So you know you don't want to be in a relationship with that person. Uh, you're, you just want, you know, some fun and then never talk to them again, hopefully ghost them. You're planning that already. So you're planning on ghosting them right, right after the thing is done. So part of you is like, yes, let's go, <laughs> right? What's the other part saying? It's like, part, another part will be slightly uncomfortable, hopefully, <laughs> right? <laughs> some of you are like, oh, what? No, <laughs> right? But part of you hopefully will be like, Hmm, I don't know. There will be a slight hesitation, right? Some of us will have a big hesitation to the point that we wouldn't even think of doing it. Some of us will be super tempted, depending on how strong your instinct is. But all of us, I believe, will have a little bit of hesitation about the idea of just using that person and then discarding them, right? That little hesitation. Are you all following me with this hesitation, or am I speaking Chinese? Uh, it's good? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so we're on the same page. We are, we're all experiencing this, right? I'm not the only one here uh, speaking Kant, right? Okay, so this little hesitation, that's your reason, saying, wait, 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 you can't do that, right? And then depending on how strong your instinct is, you'll do it or not, right? It, then you decide, of course, which one you're going to do. But you have heard the two voices. Here's another more benign example. Um, let me think. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you're, you're in the classroom. Oh, this is a good one. I love this one. 
I'll just give you an example of this. Um, so I took logic in college, um, and it really sucked for me. It was, it was really hard. Um, anyways, I was in the front row trying to really get this. And um, we were kind of a mixed class, like equal number of guys and girls. But I was in the front row, so I didn't know what was happening behind me. But when we arrived, everybody was just sitting by themselves, right? And, you know, and I was kind of struggling, you know. So one day in the middle of the semester, I looked back. And guess what had happened to the classroom? This is just so striking. All the girls had found a guy to sit next to, and they had become friends with that guy. And that guy was helping them with their logic homework. I know this is the most sexist thing you've ever heard, but this actually happened. These girls actually were becoming like logic friends. Right? And I know they were doing it because, you know, that's like, I, that looked like a really good idea at the time. I, I looked back and I was like, damn, where's my guy? <laughs> you know, so I can do that. Started looking in the front row, right? So I thought that was an excellent idea, which I hadn't even occurred to me to do. All the girls were sitting next to a guy and they were doing great because, you know, whatever, guys are better at logic apparently or something. So that was, a, so this is an example, right? You're in a classroom, somebody's really good, and now you're thinking, I have nothing in common with this person, but if I become friends with them, maybe they can help me with my homework. Ever, occurred to you, anybody? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, there you go. See? <laughs> Temptation is very great. Right? We, all, we always, we get tempted so often. Right? And hopefully, at one point, you were hesitating a little bit about this idea. Really, am I going to make this person my friend, and I don't really care about them, and then I know I'm never going to talk to them again after this because I don't like them. Right? So this is... All the time, we are tempted like this, right, to use each other. And all the time, hopefully, there is a tiny little hesitation. That hesitation is your voice of reason. The voice of reason, in other words, is the part in you which will always hold you back when you want to use another human being. It's the part in you which seeks to honor the personhood of human beings. It's the part in you which recognizes that a human being is not an object among objects. It's the part of you that recognizes that a human being is sacred ground that you can't just walk all over, right? So that's the idea, right? Now you can see more clearly what reason is, right? Reason is whenever you see, a, uh, it's like a scanner. As soon as you're about to grab a human being, reason is like, doot, 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 right? And my little alarm, <laughs> right? If I grab the bottle, reason is, you know, happy. I grab the phone, reason is cool. I'm grabbing the book. Then I start to grab it over here, Haroon, right? And now reason is like, what are you doing? Wakes up, alarm system, right? That's the idea. So, uh, and this is, by the way, the definition. Yes, Colado. Oh, sorry, oh, you had a question. This is, by the way, the definition of respect for Kant. Turn the page, and you will see that he has a very specific definition of respect, which incidentally is a test question. So, page 36. On the other hand, rational beings are called persons, so we know that, right? So reason is that which identifies in the world what is an object and what is a person and curbs our desire to use them, right? Continues, inasmuch as their nature already marks them out as ends in themselves, right? They have value in themselves. They don't, have, they don't just have value for you, <laughs> right? That's what it means. Right, just to go back to the terminology, and end in themselves is they have value independently of what they can do for you. A means is they have value for you. You can use them. They're a means. Okay, continuing. I.e. as something which is not to be merely used as a means, and hence there is imposed thereby, this is the line you underline, there is imposed thereby a limit on all arbitrary use of such beings which are thus objects of respect. Reason is that part of you which places a limit on what you can do. In other words, instinct is basically ruling the day most of the time. Most of your decisions, instinct is deciding. What shall I eat? When should I sleep? When should I study? What party should I go to? What should I wear? This is all instinct, right? But there are moments where reason will step in and will curb your desire for happiness for the sake of another human being. Reason is that part of you which is limiting instinct for the sake of a dignity of another human being. In other words, to put it simply, our happiness stops where the dignity of another human being begins. That's what reason is about, right? Our happiness stops where the dignity of another human being begins. 
at that moment, reason will always tell you, uh, 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 can't touch this, right? You know this song, right? Can't touch this, da, 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 da. <laughs> That was my time, guys. <laughs> so, yeah, I love that song. Anyways, yeah, that's the part, right? That reason will be like, uh, uh, you can touch everything, but this you cannot touch. This, this person is holy ground. You cannot use this person. You need to curb your instinct. You need to curb your desire for the sake of their dignity. Um, this is really, really powerful because we, it is so tempting sometimes to use another human being, right? The temptation can be very, very strong. And reason will pipe up, right? But most of the time we'll be like, go away. <laughs> I'm busy, right? And what Kant is saying when we do that, not only do we miss, right, the, the sanctity of another human being, not only do we trespass over that, right, but we miss our higher self, right? Basically, that's, that's the issue here, right? We miss our higher self also. Okay, now we are ready. Okay, everybody got everything? Okay, now we're ready to go back to our example. And you will tell me which one is Kant going to, to pick, right? Person needs to cheat. <clears throat> you have a lot of compassion, right? You want to help that person. What would Kant say? Or not Kant, sorry. What would your reason say? Kant, it doesn't matter. It's you. What, would, what is your instinct saying? What is your reason saying? So now let's, let's go deeper. Let's see if you can uh, distinguish a little better now that we know the whole picture. So how many of you think reason would tell you to let the person cheat? Put your hand up. One. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. How many of you think that instinct would tell you to let the person cheat? One, two, three. Okay, we're still divided. All right, good. This is a good opportunity to clarify. Okay, why do you think that reason is prescribing to you to cheat? Because uh, we were trying to cheat. Yeah, time. that was a question, yeah. So, because you said reason is like more of like the greater good instead of like the good for yourself. Ah, be careful, be careful. That's so, so good, so good. You're helping me clarify. Reason is not about the greater happiness, right? It's about dignity, right? So remember, instinct is about my happiness, your happiness, everybody's happiness, right? Reason is not concerned with happiness at all. Reason is concerned with dignity, with personhood, with respect, right? So even if, so in other words, the, the happiness of the other person is not what reason is worried about. Reason is worried about the dignity of whoever is involved. Then it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Okay, are you seeing that? So make sure you write this down, right? Reason is not about the greater good. I know we've been taught that morality is about the greater good. This is not Kant, this is Mill. This is utilitarianism. <laughs> and Kant, by the way, was an, was an adversary of Mill, M-I-L-L, -L, right? Who came up with this uh, ethical theory called utilitarianism, which I don't teach because I don't like it. <laughs> right? So we're doing Kant here, right? So utilitarianism is the idea that a, what is moral is the greater good. It makes no sense because the greater good, what do you mean? I can kill a few people so everybody will survive. What kind of ethics is that? It makes no sense. That's why I don't teach it, right? So, um, so that's Mill, that's utilitarian. That's American ethics, by the way, too, right? We are very much about the greater good uh, and so forth. So Kant was, was actually an adversary of Mill, and he said, no, no, this doesn't work, right? Because happiness is not morality. Happiness is instinct. Right? So we know that, it, that the, take, thinking of the happiness of the other person is still instinct. It's a nice instinct, a <laughs> selfless instinct, so it's, but it's not about that. Is there any place in the scenario where somebody's dignity is, at, is, is in danger? Yes. Oh, the professors, thank you. Why is that? <laughs> Why is that? The starting off of the scenario, I thought it's just like it's cheap in general. No, the, this particular scenario. Oh, I like that. Yeah, he becomes just like, oh, let's just, you know, pass the class and, you know, not tell him, like, he's nobody, he but doesn't. Yourself a means to, I think it was a means to yourself? Yeah, you become a means to, you let yourself be a means to an end to the other person, yeah. right, in a way. You let them use you, even though it's, con by the way, letting someone consensually use you is still getting used, <laughs> right? I know we say, oh, but we're both consenting adults. You're still, you're, you're still wrong, <laughs> right? Consenting adult doesn't mean you can't both destroy each other's dignity with your consent, right? So just because you're consenting doesn't mean it's moral. So even if you're consenting to be used, you're still be, there's still a problem, right? You're still 
in a way, too, their dignity is also impeded a little different than what Kant is saying because they're now, they don't have their agency. They're copying, <laughs> right? So, yes. Since you said, like, Nathan is, like, the moral of, like, because I was, like, Nathan is, like, we're divided is because we're, like, saying, we're, like, kind of, like, thinking about the happiness of the other person. Yep. So does reason, like, not pertain to, like, the happiness of someone else? Doesn't care about happiness, cares about dignity. So it's just, like, about about what? Like the moral, like what's yeah, the di and meaning dignity, meaning I don't use you and I don't discard you, like an object. That's what it means to be moral for Kant, is I don't use you, I don't throw you away, like I don't treat you like an object, basically. That's the idea. Morality, write this down, morality in Kant is not treating people like an object, meaning I don't use you and I don't discard you when I'm done, <laughs> right? I treat you differently. I abstain from using you. I honor that. Uh, your personhood, right, by abstaining from using you. So uh, happiness doesn't come into play. In fact, you can be very moral and, and create unhappiness for everybody, <laughs> right? So it's not happiness, yes. <clears throat> this example. Which one? The, the one we're talking about. Oh, this one. Yeah. Oh, okay. so so, Make them unhappy to not share, like, your empathy yeah. with them, but you're respecting their dignity. <laughs> your dignity. Yourself. You're respecting your dignity. Okay, okay. Ah, you see? So not their dignity. No, it's not in play. It's okay. not an it's issue. Not right, so notice how for Kant, right, we also matter. It's not just the dignity of other people. So reason is not just concerned about others. Reason is concerned about rational beings, whether it's you or them. It's concerned about the dignity of rational beings in general. So reason is not doesn't care about happiness. What matters is the dignity of everybody involved. And in this case, it's me who's about to lose my dignity, <laughs> right? So for the self, I preserve my dignity. That is the moral thing to do. But I create unhappiness for everybody. The, your friend, me, because I'm losing their friendship, right? The professor, because now we hate him or her, right? And there's general unhappiness that has been generated, but dignity has been preserved, right? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. yours and another person, but the action will only give dignity to the form. Give me an example, because I can't think of one. Um, it, it would be um, interesting, but yeah. I can't think of one right now. Um, Wait, yeah? Because I kind of like have like the same question, like, what, like, I guess, like, um, definitions of reform, like, morality, like, different for, like, different people. So, like, I have, like, the, like, the thought about, like, the death penalty, right? Like, what if someone, like, goes, like, on, like, killing spree, and they are, like, put to the death penalty? Would, like, Kant say, like, oh, but even if he did that, he's still human, so yes. does he not die? He would be oh, against okay. the death penalty. All right. Yeah, Kant would say no human being has the right to use another human being like an object, meaning you, you do what you want with them, right? Like so, instinct, you know, like, tell you, like, yeah, they should be put, like, he says, like, they killed someone, so then... Not, not just, I don't know if it would make, I guess it would make someone kind of happy it's if they killed someone, <laughs> like, the family, right, would be happy, but it's, it's uh, I think it would be more about... Kant is against this idea that we can have any type of control over each other, okay. right? And so this includes using, discarding, killing, stealing, cheating. This is all control, right? I'm just manipulating you, <laughs> right? Any form of manipulation, whether it's using or lying to, it's manipulation. I'm stealing from you, it's manipulation. I'm controlling you in some way. I'm cheating on you, it's manipulation. I'm killing you as the ultimate, right? All of this is your... your, your, your Destroying the dignity of another human being, and at that point, you should have a hesitation. So yes, Kant would be against the death penalty for that in that sense. Yes. Well, wasn't the victim of the example that if you got caught, both of you, like you would fail at the entire class? Because that was the example that you gave, where if like, like if you were caught, then you would fail the entire class. So Me? Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So then, I, I just, oh yeah, that I wasn't was, doing Kant. I, mean, you know, I was, I was confused because I thought that if you're isn't an instinct, aren't you looking out for yourself? If, when I'm failing the entire class? If if you aren't letting the other person cheat because then both of you are going to fail the entire class? No, why? Oh, no, you won't fail. You'll pass the test, right? Yeah, but isn't an instinct if you, you're choosing that for yourself, though? There is, yes, you can also way. choose. Uh, there's two reason, two ways to do this. You can instinctually see. You see, you can do the same action and come from instinct and from reason. That's a good example. Instinctually, I can say, "Oh hell no, I'm not helping you. I don't want to get caught." Right? 
that's instinct. But reason would be like, no, I can't help you because I feel like something in me would be, um, uh, I feel like it would be degrading for me and for you to do this. So two different motives, same action. What matters for Kant is the motive, right? So yes, you can have two, same action. So it's not the action that's moral, it's the motive. Only, so make, you, make sure you write this down, right? For Kant, there's no moral action. It's only the motive which determines whether you're acting morally or not, right? Um, okay, any other questions before I give you a really bad example? Yes. <laughs> um, so it's not the action that is moral or not, it's the motivation. Are you acting from instinct or from reason? Are you thinking of your happiness or are you thinking not of their happiness but of their dignity or your dignity? Are you thinking dignity or happiness? Are you thinking, I can't control, manipulate, use this person? Or are you thinking, what's in it for me, right? So depending on which way you're thinking, you're acting from instinct or from reason. Good, okay. <laughs> I have an example too. Okay. Yes, it just came to me. <laughs> so Go ahead. Let's say um, I just found out that one of my closest friends was cheating on their partner. And so now I'm stuck because I also have personal relations with, with their partner. Mm. So do I tell the partner that they're being cheated on? Or do I let my friend tell them themselves? Oh, what do you guys think? <laughs> What would, what would reason prescribe? I keep on thinking what would Kant say, but it's not Kant. What would reason say at that moment? What is your reason telling you you should do? To answer the question, usually when you tell like, someone, like, if, it's, like, if you know yourself, right, you guess, I think you get the like, satisfaction that you were the one that said something because that, yeah, that's why I think but it's at like... at the same time, it's like, it would be nice to tell. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I know. Yeah, I mean, if you're telling without her, it's a kind of objectification because you're overruling her agency, right? You're doing what she should do. Right. So you're, you now so you're I'm like, oh, you are, by, yes, yes. By saying something that yes. they should have said first. Yes. But then, let's say, like, you know, this person doesn't want to tell them, but then tells me, you can't say anything either. But I'm still hanging out with their partner, and their partner's, <laughs> like, hurt, and I feel like I'm lying to them now. Uh, yes, that's true. Ooh, pretty good. So then what do I do in that situation? Do I <laughs> All right, let's, let's, wait, let's try this one. Okay, what does reason prescribe? It's no way. I feel like I've been stuck in that position for my entire life. I don't know which one is the right way to go or the wrong way to go about it. You could tell your friend, you will tell them. Then now they have a choice. Mm -hmm. Right? You can be like, look, I'm going to tell them. If you don't, I will. Yeah, right. and so now the friend is actually, you've given them the choice to do X or Y, right? So, but if you do it in secret, now you're kind of, it's a control thing, right? right? So anytime you're controlling and they're in the dark, that's not good. But if you tell them, look, it's my duty <laughs> to tell them, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to tell them. <laughs> so maybe that would be the way, right? That, that sounds good. Uh, any other dilemmas? I have a really good one. This one is, I haven't, I don't think I've solved it yet. Um, Germany, 1940. Nazis knock on your door. <laughs> are you hiding any Jews? You are. Do you lie to the officer, thereby going against their dignity? Because they're human too, right? Do you lie to them, meaning now they're an object that you're trying to control? Or do you reveal? <laughs> With no shame, even. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was like trying to like say, like the fact that like, some people have different like like definitions of morality. Like for them, they thought that was what they were doing was correct. But you know, from like your standpoint, you're like, no, that's not correct. So that's what I was saying. Like how like how it like differs between them. Like, like Ooh, Kant would disagree. He would think Kant really believes that we all have the same voice of reason. So even the Nazi, right? is dimly aware <laughs> that there is an issue, right? But there are saying, see, this was the trial of Eichmann, if you remember, he was one of the main Nazi officers, and he said, yeah, I was just doing my duty. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he realized, he knows it's wrong, but he, he also has another standard, which is I need to obey authority. And that standard was higher than the standard of I need to protect humanity, but he has the standard to protect humanity, otherwise he wouldn't have to say I was doing my duty, right? So 
even the Nazis dimly aware there's something off, but they have the, there's a stronger voice leaning towards I have to do this, I have no choice, right? Yeah, this is the the this is really the this is the big lie that evil gives us that it tells us there is no other way, right? You know the the song Hotel California. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. That's a lie. You can always check out, right? It's, it's, it, when we are caught in a spiral of evil, we get into the point where we don't feel we can leave. And that's what the song is about, right? Being caught up in a spiral of evil uh, and feeling like I can just check out, but I can't leave. This is one of the biggest lies of evil to tell you you can't leave, right? And this was the trap that the Nazis were caught in, right? A lot of them were decent human beings, but they were caught in the evil, the trap of evil, where I have no choice. Yeah, you always have a choice, <laughs> right? So, so even the Nazi officer had a choice, knows, right? So, and for Kant, he's still human, yes. <laughs> right? To be human doesn't mean you're a good person. Hitler was a rational being for Kant. Hitler was worthy of dignity for Kant, right? So everybody... Even the mass murderer that you want to put in the death penalty, you cannot kill him. There's still, as a human being, there's still something sacred about them, right? So, so now what happens? How do you deal with the, what do you tell the Nazi? <laughs> See if some of you are smart. <laughs> what would the Kantian do? It's hard because now you've got to protect the dignity of the, well, no, it's not really the dignity, right? If you're, hmm, go ahead. <laughs> I would say on me to tell them the truth. It's what? The basis itself is not on me. I tell them that there's a thing that happens. Oh, so you say nothing? No, I would say no. Ah, oh, you would lie. So now you have destroyed the dignity of the Nazi officer. How could you? But the, 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 the dignity of the Jew would be destroyed as well. Yeah. So well, but it's not you who's destroying it. It's them. You see, there's a difference. So for Kant, there's a difference. But you're the one giving them away. If you choose yeah. to let them do that. Yeah. Yeah. Think about you, what's uh, yes. You're choosing to let them know what's going to happen. You're attacking me. <laughs> to attack. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, all right, dude's in your house. We're just going to take him for a walk. No. Yeah. You know what's going to happen yeah. to them. True. You know they're going to destroy them. Okay, so how can you do it? Happen. How can you do it without denying the Nazi his. Yeah. Just no matter what, you're destroying somebody's dignity. It's possible. There's a way. <laughs> If you Nobody take them, is that taking two? Okay, so that's one way, yes. <laughs> no, true. Yes, that's 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 very so content. You're not lying, but you're also not like I mean, just, yes, just yes, 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 yes. So. Yeah, right. Uh, what's another way you could do this? <laughs> I mean, you do know, though. You do know. Uh, <laughs> staying silent, maybe? <laughs> yes, it's suspicious, but you're not doing anything. You know what I mean? You're not really... It seems to me the only way. You stay silent. They might get really pissed, or they might not. You don't know. It doesn't matter. The consequences don't matter. The matter is you're preserving the dignity of this office. You're preserving the dignity of your people who you're hiding. One way. There's a funny story. Um, there's this, um, she was um, a Christian who, was, uh, who had to go to Auschwitz because she was doing that precisely, um, having Jews in her house. And she recalls a story where they had hidden some a family under the dining room table, there was a trap door, and they put them there, and then there was a rug, and then the table. And they were all sitting there, and she had a younger sister. And same thing happens. Now, Nazis come. Are there any Jews in the house? Now, they're Christians. They can't lie, right? So they're really serious about their Christianity. So they're silent. And then at one moment, the little girl is so stressed about the situation. She says, she screams, yes, we have Jews, and they're under the table. And then she starts laughing hysterically because she's so nervous, right? And she looked so silly that the Nazis were like, oh, they thought she, yeah, they thought she was making fun of them. And they're like, ah, you know, and they left. Wow. <laughs> so it's one very poignant example of telling the truth and getting away with it. <laughs> so there seems to be ways. <laughs> right. But Kant, by the way, himself is aware of this issue. And if you want to read, he talks about it in the last, there's a little 
chapter called On the Supposed Right to, to Lie. And he goes against lying, right? Because, see, this is the thing we have to understand with Kant, right? Sometimes, yes, it is justified to lie, but it is still morally wrong. I really want to bring that home to you, right? Because this is very important. Sometimes, yes, it is justified. It makes sense. It makes sense on all levels, on the level of survival, on the level of, uh, you know, you, you love, compassion, right? But you still have to accept that it's still morally wrong. At that moment, you still have committed a moral offense. So if you're willing to, to live in the tension, right? The same thing with killing, by the way, right? Suppose you're at home and someone comes in with a machine gun and they're about to shoot down everybody, and thankfully you have a gun if you're a gun owner and if you're into those things. Um, what, what, and you say, well, I, I have to shoot this guy before they shoot my family, right? So you shoot them, you're justified, but you're still committed. There's still a moral wrong that was done. Even though we understand it makes sense, it's justified, it's still morally wrong. Right? This is the issue with um, fighting in the army, right? You know you have to do it. You know it's honorable. You know it's it's a necessary evil, it's but also you. Like also, like you're a cop and like. Uh, yeah, same a thing. Exactly. 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 So, so the problem with veterans, right, is that we don't have a system set up for them to deal with a moral issue, right? We give them whatever I don't know money. We give them, <laughs> but there's no process whereby they can um, really release. Because we don't consider it morally wrong to fight in the army, you see? Fighting in the army and killing the enemy is 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 okay, <laughs> right? We, nobody's questioning this, right? But they come back all messed up because they know deep down that there's some issue, right? There's some, some, something went deeply wrong because they had to do Does that make sense? So there, there needs to be a system in place for them to deal also with the moral consequences of, of being in the army, not just, the, not just losing a limb, not just, you know, the PTSD, I think, is one of the ways to address PTSD is to deal with the moral issue, right, and, and find a way for them to uh, release it, right? Um, so, that's, and so that's what Kant is saying. Even if you're justified, you have to do it. You're, everybody's going to die if you don't do it. Still, there is a moral weight you have to carry and you have to process, right? I, th I thought there was a comment popping up over here at one point. No? Right. I mean, yeah. it's in a way, I mean, the way we're doing it, of course, is not morally right at all. But I mean, imagine we were being invaded because we're not being invaded, which is going over there. Right. But <laughs> if we were really being invaded and in danger, yeah. then, of course, everybody, you know, will feel I mean, it, it's really justified to fight and it's noble. But still, we have to realize that we will still carry a moral scar and we have to come to terms with that and not just act like nothing happened. Right? Well, in terms of, I mean, like self-defense where you have to hit someone yeah. and they attack you first. Exactly. You like the police, like you were saying, right? They, there's a suffering there, a moral suffering, right? And so I think that's so. I do think Kant is onto something, even though it sounds extreme. You can't lie, or you're gonna to the Nazi officer. Yeah, you can. You can do anything you want, but know that you have scarred yourself morally, and that you have. It doesn't mean you're a bad person now. It doesn't mean that you'll be scarred for life. It means you need to deal with it, <laughs> and not ignore it like it doesn't exist. You have to find a way to deal with this uh, trauma which you have inflicted on yourself moral trauma right and really try to find ways to and you can of course overcome the moral trauma and you can cleanse it you can you know go over it but you have to first face it and we are not ready as a society to face the fact that certain actions remain morally wrong even if they're justified right so that's i think one of the great values of kant right what he's saying he's really reminding us i mean that voice you know, when you're fighting, I don't know if you saw the movie uh, Jarhead. Did you see the movie Jarhead? The, these guys to fight, they have to put on this heavy metal music to just block their brain, right? So it, was that in the movie? Where, never? Am I, <laughs> am I mixing up with another movie? Uh, when you, uh, maybe it was another movie, but uh, when they're in their tanks, right? Um, our... Um, or army people, right? They actually put on some very, very loud music with very, very violent, violent lyrics so they can get pumped up, right? Because it's not easy to do that, right? Because the moral voice is so strong. But you know you have to do it. So they have to. So it's really a violence against themselves, right, that they're doing, that they're going through. And we need to acknowledge 
and they need to be able to acknowledge that this is a violence against themselves and then process it, right? And this is what, sadly, I don't know if we're doing this, <laughs> right? We're doing some counseling here and there, we're giving them drugs, you know, but are we really addressing the moral issue of war? And if we really took it seriously that there is a moral issue, why are we going on so many wars, right? Let me not get started. Okay, yes. <laughs> Finally, yeah, <laughs> about so time. Who who dared? Who who dared? Um, the ICC? I don't, oh, it was the it was the UN. Oh, yeah, the, maybe the ICC. Yeah, the because I'm, did you notice how the International Criminal Court always Africans, right? Always Africans doing these terrible acts of violence. Because of course, when somebody's going around with an axe, it looks more violent than a drone. But it's the same thing, right? Technology has made killing so clean, <laughs> right? But, and then when you see someone with a machete, right, it looks like a complete, you know, crazy person. So um, African leaders are arrested left and right, but our leaders, I would like to see a couple personally, you know. <laughs> I would really like that. Anyways, before I alienate half the class, um, <laughs> so there is many different political views, <laughs> which I, 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 I respect all views. <laughs> Those are just mine. Okay. Maybe Kant. All right, any more questions about Kant? Uh, we have one minute left. Okay, your test is coming up. Let me remind you that you have two questions, one on uh, Groomy, thank you, <laughs> and one on Kant, which we just did today. Uh, remember a whole page, right, of answer per question, so two pages total, single spaced. You want to make sure to put in as much of your notes as possible. If you're still confused what I'm looking for, just write everything, okay? That's what some people do. It works. So if you're really like, what does she want, what does she want, I don't understand her, just write everything and you'll be fine, right? So it takes a little more time, but you're guaranteed an aid. Uh, so, and remember supportive quotes, right? You want to always bring in quotes that we've read in class in your answer. And then your essay, right, the love crisis. Remember, you need two things. You need a love crisis, preferably yours. <laughs> and then you need to see, is there anything that we studied that can now help me move forward or help unravel this crisis, help the couple, right? doesn't have to be you, but it's, it's ideal if it's you. Uh, and that's 1.5 pages single space. And then next week, of course, we start uh, Kierkegaard, right? So... You listen to the lecture and you do the reading and so forth. Okay, I'll stop the recording.